You may be seated. For those of you who are raised in Sunday schools or vacation Bible schools when you're younger, you're probably already singing the lyrics in your head. And I'm not going to try singing it for you this morning, but Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior came that way, he looked up in the tree and said, Zacchaeus, you come down from there, for I'm going to your house today. I'm going to your house today. As great as that song is for children, I think there's a big problem with it. Not theologically, it's just that it stops too soon. The best part about the story of Zacchaeus is not his tree climbing ability. It's his glorious salvation by Jesus. So he demonstrates a lot of faith. He climbs a tree, receives Jesus into a home, and then he gives his wealth away. But better than what Zacchaeus did is what Jesus was doing the entire time. He was seeking and saving the lost. Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus, but Jesus was seeking him first. Jesus knew him, he loved him, and sought him out in order that he might be saved. And of course he was. Now, before we get to Zacchaeus, maybe we should just call him Zach. No, we'll call him Zacchaeus. When we get to Zacchaeus, we need to back up just a little bit. Because before this rich man ever got saved, we see another rich man who is not saved. Remember back in Luke chapter 18, and it starts up at verse 18, but we see the rich young ruler, a wealthy young man of privilege and power who was esteemed by all who saw him. He sought out Jesus to find the final key of his assurance that he was going to experience eternal life, inherit eternal life. And he was, in his own eyes, righteous. But upon a conversation with Jesus, he soon learned that he wasn't nearly as righteous as he believed himself to be. And Jesus, through his questions, points out that this man was wed to his wealth. And he's unwilling to give it up in order to follow Jesus as a disciple. In the end, he shows himself to be a self-righteous idolater. And as long as he was that, it was going to be impossible for him to be saved. Now that man was soon contrasted with another person at the end of chapter 18, when Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, where he had prophesied yet again that he would be delivered over to the Gentiles, killed, and would yet rise from the dead. Of course, we know that was a prophecy the disciples didn't quite understand yet, but it needed to be said anyway as a witness. But outside of Jericho, a blind man, other gospels name him as Bartimaeus, heard of Jesus of Nazareth, and he heard that Jesus was approaching, and he repeatedly cried out to him, asking for mercy from the Son of David. And in contrast with the rich young ruler, this blind, poor man, who's at the very bottom rung of society, yet he uh, saw something in his blindness that the rich man did not. He saw his own desperate need for salvation, and Jesus granted it to him along with his sight, literally saying, even though it's translated differently, literally saying, your faith has saved you. And as a result, the blind man, and of course all who witnessed the miracle, gave glory, praises, honor to God. So now what? Well, Jesus continues his journey to Jerusalem. He's passing through Jericho and comes upon this chief tax collector named Zacchaeus. And this man is desperate to see Jesus, and he does whatever he can in order that he might see Jesus. And what he doesn't know at the time is that Jesus was the one seeking him. Jesus had come to seek and to save the lost And you know what? Zacchaeus happened to be next in line. Jesus still seeks and saves the lost. Are we going to receive him when he seeks us? And as we look at this, it can be divided really into two main parts, but each part we can look at from Zacchaeus' point of view, and we can look at it from Jesus' point of view. So verses 1 through 7, where Zacchaeus is seeing Jesus, but we also see Jesus seeking Zacchaeus. Verse 1, then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And, it, and again, it was just outside Jericho that Jesus encountered the blind man. Apparently, as we talked about last week, Jesus had left the ruins of old Jericho, uh, healed the blind man, and entered into the newer location of the then current Jericho to pass through town. Well, why did Jesus need to pass through? Because Jericho is on the road to Jerusalem. I would normally have had a map up here for you today, but with a situation, I couldn't have that provided for you. But Jericho was... If you were going to go to Jerusalem on the route that he was taking, you had to go through Jericho. And it's imperative for us to remember that the ultimate goal for Jesus was Jerusalem. Jericho is not the end result. Jerusalem was. Jerusalem was a place that he was going to be delivered over to the Gentiles, killed, and then, of course, rise again. The end of chapter 18, verses 32 and 33. Jesus' ultimate mission was always in sight for him, 
and in this general chronology of Luke, things are starting to come to a head. And so everything he does from this point on needs to be read and understood with that end goal in mind. No matter what anyone else was thinking at the time, Jesus himself was thinking of the cross. He was thinking of his soon suffering and his sacrifice and the salvation that would result. Now, what does that mean in this particular case? It means that what Jesus says in verse 10 was already on his mind in verse 1. It means that Jericho was not a random city along the road, nor was Zacchaeus a random sinner. Jesus was mission-minded. He came to seek and save the lost, and he was doing it not only in Jerusalem, but all along the way. See, this is the eternal plan of God at work. He has always desired for you to be saved. Uh, Ephesians talks about it, Revelation talks about it, that Jesus was slain before the very foundation of the world. He's always had us in mind. This is his love for you. This is his desire for you, that all men would be saved, come to the knowledge of the truth. The only question is whether or not we are going to respond to him. Now, within this not random city was a not random individual whom Luke introduces in verse 2. Now, behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Now, the name Zacchaeus is interesting. It seems to be derived from the Hebrew word meaning pure, which is a bit ironic when we consider his occupation. He was a chief tax collector. And we remember that Levi or Matthew was also a tax collector, but he wasn't a chief tax collector. So this guy is at a higher status than what Levi or Matthew used to be, right? Uh, tax collectors were typically considered to be traitors among the Jews. They uh, had purchased basically franchise rights to collect taxes within a certain area. And they uh, you know, paid the Roman government to be able to do that. And so they were employed, in a sense, by the Roman government. So they're, uh, you know, these were occupiers. And the Jews despised these tax collectors who worked for them. And he would have been extra to despise just because of his extra administrative responsibilities. You know, he's the traitor in chief among other traitors. And apparently he was really, really good at it because Luke notes that he was rich. Now, considering that the Romans rarely, if ever, actually paid people to collect taxes, how did tax collectors become rich? They skimmed it off the top. As long as the Romans were paid what they were owed, they didn't care how much money the tax collectors were paid. Tax collectors could and would charge whatever they wanted. So you put it all together, Zacchaeus is a turncoat to his countrymen, and he's a greedy crook to boot because he's charging them a lot more than what they actually owe, and he's the one benefiting from it. Yet something was going on in his heart. Obviously, God had done something within this man to draw him to Jesus, because as soon as he heard that Jesus was coming through Jericho, he does his best to go and to see him. Look at verse 3, And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. Now, this is the part that most people remember. For good reasons, it's a little bit comical. Here's this rich man. He's crooked, but he's rich. He's got a lot of influence among the Romans. He's no doubt well-dressed, carries an air of authority. Yet here he is climbing into a tree like a little kid in order to catch a glimpse of the Lord and his parade route through town. Right? The crowds following Jesus would have been quite thick by this point. It's not as if, you know, we see today, you go to parades, and you got these drone cameras going overhead, we just look on our phone to get a close-up. It didn't have that then, right? If you were going to see Jesus, you had to get a direct line of sight. And so, as a shorter man, what was he going to do? He needed to climb to a higher vantage point. And so that's what he did in all of his expensive clothing, and all of his heirs. Here he is climbing a, a sycamore tree. Now, in all the humor, don't miss the main point. Zacchaeus did whatever was necessary to see Jesus despite potential ridicule, despite potential humiliation. Now put yourself in his shoes for a moment, because no doubt people took notice of Zacchaeus everywhere that he went. Not out of admiration, out of disgust, out of hatred. There's that guy. Now he would have been used to the looks and the sneers and probably adapted it to it because, you know, he was abusing people through his abuse of power and authority. But in this moment, he sets all of his dignity aside And he humbles himself in order to climb the sycamore tree. Nothing special about the sycamore tree. That's just the type of tree it was, right? It's noted here. Now, whatever were the thoughts of others, he couldn't care about those other people and their thoughts 
At the very least, whatever he had known about Jesus, he knew that Jesus was a man of God. And this is a man he couldn't afford to have passed by without least looking upon him. He had to see him. He had this urgent need to do so. So Zacchaeus is willing to do whatever it took. What are you willing to do in order to see Jesus? What steps of faith are you willing to take? Now, keep in mind that the only reason Zacchaeus or anyone else would go through any of this is because he saw a need. Whatever it was he understood Jesus to be, and we don't know what was going on in his mind beforehand. He might have just thought himself to be a prophet, might have thought Jesus to be a good teacher, but whatever he thought, he knew at least this much. He had he had this burning desire to see Jesus. And knowing the sinful position that Zacchaeus himself was in, he understood that if he didn't see Jesus at this time, he wasn't ever going to get another chance to see Jesus at all. So his need was so desperate, he knew he had to act. Many people aren't willing to take those steps of faith because they never understand their need. They don't understand their desperate situation without Christ. Understand that without the salvation of God, we are nothing but walking dead. Regardless what HBO or Netflix or whatever puts on. We are the walking dead without Jesus. We are sinners doomed for the eternal wrath of our righteous creator. That's a desperate situation. Not a single person is going to be able to talk themselves out of hell. They're not going to be able to stand before God and convince God that he was wrong about them. They're not going to be able to justify themselves in his sight. He will see us either in our sin or he'll see us clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Which will it be? It depends on whether or not you ever see your need for Jesus. By the way, this thought doesn't really only apply to you know, non-believers. This is just as true for born-again believers, born-again Christians as it is for anyone else. Because after all, when do we ever stop having a desperate need for our Lord Jesus? Never. When do we not need to take steps of faith? Never. But we do what it takes to follow Jesus simply because he is our Lord. Sometimes that means sacrifice. Sometimes that's going to mean ridicule. Sometimes it means the hatred of the world. And Jesus said not to be surprised when the world hates Christians because the world hated him first. John 15, verse 18. Our job, we don't worry about that. Our job is just trust Jesus and follow him. Take up our cross daily and follow him. Some of you, I don't know this for sure, but I, I imagine in a room this size, this is the case. Some of you are going through situations where you have been required to make a choice. You need to make that choice. You can either continue to hide among the crowds or you can humble yourself and take a step of faith. And I would implore you to take that step of faith and follow your Lord Jesus. Verse 5, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Please notice that Jesus was the one calling to Zacchaeus. Now, Zacchaeus had gone up the tree to see Jesus, but Jesus came seeking him. He even knew Zacchaeus by name. Jesus knew everything about this man, though there's no indication that Zacchaeus had ever prior to this point said a single word. Think about it, up in the tree, Zacchaeus is probably hiding, right? He wants to see Jesus, but it's not very likely that he wanted himself to be seen. But Jesus knew him. Jesus saw him. Jesus knew exactly where he was, who he was, and what it was he needed. Jesus had come seeking him, and he found him. And not only did he seek out Zacchaeus, he spoke to him. He said, make haste and come down. Climb out of that comical watching place. Don't waste any time. Just come on down. And why did Jesus want him to come out of the tree? Because it was necessary if Jesus was going to dine with him that night. What did he say? He said, for today I must stay at your house. Now that must is very definite in the Greek. This is a necessary action. Why was it so necessary? Surely there are other places Jesus could have stayed while in Jericho. Crowds of people were following him around, no doubt. Any one of them would have found Jesus a room, would have provided dinner for them that night. They would have been honored to do so. Why was it necessary, with all these other choices around, why was it necessary for Jesus to stay with Zacchaeus? I'll tell you why it's necessary, because how else would Zacchaeus be saved? Jesus could have, excuse me, Zacchaeus could have remained in the tree. He could have been continually looking onward to Jesus. It took faith for him to climb up there in the first place, 
But that wasn't necessarily saving faith. After all, he hadn't yet met Jesus. He hadn't personally encountered him. Jesus had come to seek and to save the lost, and he knew that Zacchaeus was a lost sinner ready to be saved. But if Zacchaeus was going to be saved, he needed to personally encounter Jesus. This was necessary. Please understand, no one is ever saved apart from a personal interaction with the Lord Jesus. And don't misunderstand, it's not that we, we need the physical person to show up in front of us like Zacchaeus or like you know, you know, Saul, we know him as Paul, did after Jesus' resurrection. We don't need that physical appearance, but we do need a personal interaction. We need personal faith. We need to know about Jesus, but no one is saved through knowledge alone. Jesus was known by Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus could look upon Jesus remotely as he passed by, but that is not what saved him. Zacchaeus needed to know the person of Jesus, and so do we. We are not saved by an idea. We are not saved by theology. We are saved by the living God. We have to know this God in real faith, and that means real relationship. And there's a lot of people out there that have faith in an idea. They have faith in a theology, and if you know me, I'm a huge proponent of theology, but that's not what saves us. And a lot of people just have faith in some theological notion without actually knowing the person of Jesus. You want your faith to be in his person. He is alive and he interacts with those who seek him. Verse 6, so he made haste, Zacchaeus did, and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Quite the contrast here, right? Zacchaeus rejoices, the crowds complained. Zacchaeus was not ashamed to have Jesus call him out from his humble climbing spot. He was joyful. He couldn't come down out of that tree fast enough to respond to Jesus and bring him to his house. He heard the invitation of his Savior, and he acted. So this is Zacchaeus' second act of faith, right? Because not only had he done whatever was necessary to see Jesus, he joyfully received Jesus to himself. Again, it's one thing to desire to see him, it's another to hear his call and to heed him and to receive him personally. But what about the crowds? Why did the crowds complain? Well, likely a couple of reasons. One's not said here. One, they were probably jealous, right? They, Jesus had chosen somebody other than them. But two, what is said here, which is most obvious from the text, is that the person chosen by Jesus was deemed as less worthy than themselves. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He's a sinner so despised by the people that they don't even call him by name. Oh, they knew his name. That's not what they called him. This sinner. How could Jesus choose to dine with a man like that? So they murmured and they grumbled among themselves in their pompous self-righteousness. You might recall that this has been a common complaint about Jesus. Uh, recently seen in the circumstances surrounding the parable of the lost sheep. Keep your finger here if you would, but turn back just quickly over to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. And it says in verse 1, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep, which was lost. I say to you, likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Why was it spoken? Because the tax collectors were coming to him. The sinners were coming to him, and he was receiving them. He was welcoming them. And the people got jealous. They said, These people aren't worthy. Jesus said, They're lost. And I've come to seek them out. What Jesus taught in chapter 15 is what is illustrated here in chapter 19. A tax collector did draw near to Jesus, and Jesus gladly ate with him, choosing him over the 99 or however many other people there were in Jericho. They were just as lost as this man was, but they didn't seek Jesus the way this man did. They didn't understand how lost they were the way this man did. Again, Jesus knew this lost sheep was ready to be found, and he acted accordingly. Now, does this go against the expectations of the crowd? Well, sure it does. 
Why wouldn't Jesus you know, go with the more religious people? Why, why not sit down and go to dinner with the, the guy who was you know, in synagogue every single Saturday and the one who served and was always there every time the door was open? Why doesn't he go to the house of the more religious people? That's what we would expect. Jesus isn't bound according to our expectations. We are not the determiners of whether or not someone is worthy of salvation. Newsflash, none of us are worthy of salvation. It's solely by the grace of God that anyone is saved. For those who ask, why Zacchaeus? The answer is simply, why not? Why any of us? None of us deserve to be saved, yet God saw fit to seek us out and to save us. We were the one lost among the 99 around us, and Jesus came for us. That's his mercy and his love and his grace. By the way, if you're waiting to prove yourself worthy to Jesus before responding to him in faith, don't, because you'll never do it. Think of who he is, who Jesus is. He is perfection personified, right? The living God, the very definition of holiness. And who are we in comparison with him? The best of us fall way, 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 way short. You know, in track and field meets, um, you ever see the high jump, not the pole vault necessarily, but the high jump. They, they compete over inches, fractions of inches. Well, they compete over, you know, centimeters, metric system, but we're Americans. So they, they compete over <laughs> fractions of inches. But what do their jumps, as high as they are, compare with the height of the stadium in which they're competing? Jesus isn't just a little holier than us, where we need just a little less sin in order to be saved. You know, the gap between us and Jesus is infinite. For sinners to compare themselves to other sinners, thinking ourselves more righteous than the next guy's for us to compete over fractions of inches when there are light years between us and Jesus. So stop trying to prove yourself worthy because you'll never do it. All you can do is personally interact with Jesus and receive him by faith as Lord. So that's what happens here. And Zacchaeus goes on to trust Jesus, and we see Jesus saving him in verses 8 and 9. Uh, or 8 through 10, rather. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half my goods to the poor, and if I've taken anything from anyone by a false accusation, I restore fourfold. Apparently, some time passes between verses 7 and 8, right? Because one moment Jesus is inviting himself to dinner in a good way. We wouldn't necessarily do that. But when Jesus invites himself to dinner, we want to accept it, right? And in the next moment, we apparently find Zacchaeus in his home, standing at the table, responding to the grace of God. Now, what exactly happened in the meantime, we don't know. Can you imagine? I would love to have been a fly on the wall for the dinner conversation that night. That must have been astounding. Whatever happened, whatever was said, Zacchaeus is overwhelmed by the person of Christ, and he's compelled to respond in some way. What does he do? He promises two things. The first thing he promises is to give half of his possessions to the poor. Now, considering that he was rich, this would have been a really massive act of almsgiving, something which was, in that culture, even today, uh, seen to be a sincere act of faith. Other people, though, when they would give alms, they'd give out of their spare change, they'd give out of their abundance, but Zacchaeus promised to give absolutely sacrificially, half of it away. And the second thing he promised to do was to restore fourfold what he had taken through dishonest means. And no doubt Zacchaeus had been dishonest. Understand that what he says here isn't so much, I don't know whether or not I've, I, I've done this, but if I have been dishonest, I'll restore it. That's not what he's saying here. He's actually saying something more along the lines of, I most definitely did these things, and I'm resolved to act. Uh, the if, the way the Greek grammar works out, is, is virtually carries the idea of the word since. It's a condition, but it's a condition that's certain to be true. So Zacchaeus is basically confessing his sin. I have been dishonest. I have swindled people. And he's promising now to make restitution. And depending on the circumstances, the law of Moses required somebody pay back fourfold or fivefold, whatever it was that was stolen originally. Uh, you can read about an instance of that in Exodus 22, verse 1. If you have stolen an ox, you've stolen a sheep, uh, give back fourfold sheep, fivefold the oxen, that sort of thing. And so that's what Zacchaeus vowed to do. Do the right thing. What did the law require? He was going to follow the word of God on the matter. Now, compare all of this at this point with the rich young ruler from Luke 18. That person had come to Jesus looking for what he could do to assure himself of eternal life. And Jesus told him to address his idolatry by what? By selling off his possessions and to give the proceeds to the poor. And what do we read in verse 23? 
But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. He refused, and he turns away sad. Not Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus did what the rich young ruler could not. Now, considering all of the money Zacchaeus had from collecting taxes was from charging extra on top of what the Romans demanded, virtually every cent he owned was gained dishonestly. So between giving away half his goods to the poor and giving back four times what he had taken, surely he's got nothing left at this point. Zacchaeus actually fulfilled the commandment that the Lord Jesus had given to the rich young ruler. The sinner did what the self-righteous could not. And that's exactly why only sinners can be saved. Have you admitted your sinfulness for what it is? Until you see yourself as you truly are, you'll never see your need for a Savior. Zacchaeus saw the need and he was willing to give everything away in order that he might receive Jesus. What was all this? What was he doing? These were acts of repentance. Zacchaeus' whole life was changing in his interaction with Jesus, and he can't help but respond in some way. He had met the Messiah. He was dining that moment with the son of David. He had personally experienced the love of God. So what else could he do other than forsake his sin? He was changed on the inside, so it's only natural that his outside changes as well. And this is when Jesus gives him grand assurance. Look at verse 9. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. Now question, which came first, salvation or repentance? Zacchaeus announced his repentance first, but by no means did he purchase his salvation. Salvation is the free gift of God, and Zacchaeus' repentance was his response to it. How do we know? Well, simple. Well, we look at the tense. If God's salvation was response to Zacchaeus' repentance, it would have made more sense for Jesus to speak in the present tense, saying that the salvation is now coming to this house. Or affirm that Zacchaeus, you have now earned your place in eternal life. But that's not what Jesus said. The Greek is, uh, is, English is past tense. Greek is the aorist tense. But it basically indicates that salvation had already come to the house. And Jesus simply announced it. If anything, the salvation of God was in response to the newly existing faith of Zacchaeus, which was seen in his persistence and his reception of Jesus. And his acts of repentance are just the outflow of his faith. Please beware of making repentance a work that earns salvation. Are we to repent when we come to faith in Christ? Absolutely, without question, because a Christian without repentance is no Christian at all. The person who claims to trust Jesus as Savior and Lord is a person who's been given a new birth by God the Holy Spirit. He's been made a new creation. Thus, that person acts differently. Now, not every Christian uh, you know, changes in the same way at the same time at the same speed or anything like that, but all Christians change in some way over time. And so eventually, you know, the sin that once appealed to us becomes abhorrent. Our, starts, our hearts start to hunger for the things of God. This is the essence of repentance. It's a change of mind. It's a change of action. And it's not something that we can do on our own apart from the power of God. On our own, we're just as lost and helpless as we ever were. It's when we believe upon Jesus that he gives us the strength to repent. Why does this matter it seems kind of esoteric and theological. Why does this matter? Because it's the difference between legalism and grace. It's the difference between a works-based faith and a faith that works. When people claim, and you hear this so often, you better clean up your life before you ever head back to church. You better clean, don't head back into that doors of the church before you clean up your life. What they're saying is you better save yourself before you trust Jesus to save you. That's not the gospel. The gospel is the good news of Jesus. It's the fact that we simply believe upon him and receive the salvation that he freely offers. Now, repentance accompanies our faith, but by no means does it precede our faith. Again, repentance is necessary. Real faith in Christ is more than lip service, more than just praying a prayer. It's more than just checking it off the list. Real faith in Jesus and trusting ourselves to the living Son of God, knowing that the risen Jesus is our only hope for salvation. And the way that faith is made evident is through acts of repentance. We let go of our sin as we grab hold of our Savior. But it's grabbing hold of Jesus that saves us. It's not the act of letting go of our sin. 
That's just what accompanies our trust. Does that make sense? Another thing. Zacchaeus, in Jesus' eyes, Jesus doesn't even point to Zacchaeus' actions as a reason for his salvation. What, what does he say here? Today salvation has come to this house because Zacchaeus repented it and gave all his stuff away. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm adding to the word of God. What does it actually say? Today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. That was the reason he points to. Because he also is a son of Abraham. Zacchaeus was who he was by the grace of God. And the grace of God had been fully extended to him in Jesus. And it's only now that Zacchaeus actually understood it and walked accordingly. Other Jews at the time did not see Zacchaeus as a son of Abraham. They see him as a betrayer and a traitor to Abraham. So excluded from the covenant promises of God. But that's not true. Jesus knew who Zacchaeus truly was. Jesus knew who God the Father intended Zacchaeus to be from the foundation of the world. Zacchaeus was a full son of Israel. Especially now that he recognized the Messiah of Israel as he truly was. So Zacchaeus may have been lost, but now he's truly found and that's what Jesus affirms in verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. This isn't just a summary of what Jesus did with Zacchaeus. This is a summary of Jesus' mission as a whole. And if you want a key verse upon which to hang the entire gospel of Luke, this is it. Jesus has come. The Son of Man, the glorious, divine, incarnate God has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus is the good shepherd we read about in Luke 15, the one who leaves the 99 to go and save the one. Jesus did whatever was necessary in order that lost human beings might be saved. Think about it. Jesus did not just come to earth at some random point in history and, and wander around in Judea for three years, and spout off pithy truths. No, Jesus had a mission. And he says what his mission was right here. Break it down. Jesus came. Again, it's not just any man. It's the son of man. But let's just take it from that point. Jesus came. That by itself is amazing. The glorious son of man. The one who shares eternal past, present, and future with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. The one who shares in all the glory of God because he is God. This son of man, he came to earth. He willingly left the glories of heaven behind in order to put on flesh and walk as an incarnate man among sinners like us. That is glorious condescension. That is grace that he would come at all. But that's not where it stops. Jesus came to seek. What Jesus did with Zacchaeus, Jesus did with all the world. He came seeking us out. We did not search for God. We showed through our rebellion that we wanted nothing to do with God. And even those who make some attempts at some form of religion, they don't truly seek God. What they're doing is they're attempting to justify themselves and make themselves right rather than falling upon the mercies and the grace of the God who's revealed himself to all the world through creation. But whereas we did not seek God, he sought us. Jesus takes the initiative to seek out all those who might be saved. And that's the third part of his mission. Jesus came to seek and to save his was not merely a fact-finding mission. He didn't come to take inventory, just to count how many people were truly lost. He didn't come to just tell us how lost we are and never offer us a drop of hope. No, Jesus came to do a work, the supreme work of salvation. Jesus came to save. And again, this is why he was so singularly focused on going to Jerusalem because that was a place where this work of salvation would be accomplished. His death on the cross, his resurrection three days later would become the one single act that would make salvation possible for all the world. This is what Jesus came to do and this is what he still does. Though he physically resides in heaven today having forever completed his death and resurrection, Jesus still seeks and saves the lost. He still calls to people as unworthy as we are. He invites us to respond to him, to receive his gift of salvation, receive his forgiveness. I remember when he sought me, I was not looking for him. I was just a kid at a concert looking for free rock and roll. Then he called me and I had to respond. He seeks us first. 
Jesus seeks and saves the lost. That's what he did with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus responded in kind. Zacchaeus climbed a tree to see Jesus, only to find that Jesus had been seeking him the entire time. Zacchaeus joyfully responded to Jesus, receiving him into his home, which is exactly what Jesus said was necessary to happen. Finally, Zacchaeus expressed his faith in Jesus, trusting him so much that he would give away every penny he had in true repentance of his sin, to which Jesus gave him the confirmation that he was already a child of Abraham, truly saved by the grace of God. What a great story of salvation. And you know what the great thing is as a born-again Christian when we read stories of salvation? We get the opportunity to remember our own. Because every single one of us who is born again, who we have faith in Jesus, every single one of us, were once at the point of Zacchaeus. Now our testimonies vary, but we were all sinners, completely lost, totally separated from God, yet Jesus sought us out and extended to us his salvation. Never forget. Never take it for granted. Always remember who you were and how Jesus changed you. Now, true born-again Christians will never again be eternally lost. But it's so interesting that the Bible never tells us to forget who we were. Not once. Oh, we don't live in that. That's not who we are. Never forget who we are. But he never says in the Bible to forget who we were. To the contrary, well into Paul's ministry, he still referred to himself as the chief of all sinners. 1 Timothy 1.15. He'd been saved for years. He had been the instrument of uh, the gospel going forth to, to multitudes by that point, and he still, at that point, called himself currently the chief of all sinners. Not once did Paul ever forget who he was or what he did prior to Jesus saving him. Now, he knew he was a child of God. He knew he was saved, but he never took the grace he had received for granted, and neither should we. If you've been saved, rejoice, praise God, thank Him for seeking you out and for saving you. Never forget from whence you came and always walk forward in the joyful grace of God. Now for others, you may remember a time in your life when you encountered Jesus, but you haven't really remained in that place of gratefulness and repentance. You've wandered away. And perhaps it's become difficult to tell the difference between your life in the life of someone who's never met Jesus at all. I'm not going to stand up here and give you any assurances whatsoever regarding your past, but I can give you assurance that something can change regarding your future. You need to trust Jesus. You need to let go of your sins to grab hold of the Savior and entrust yourself fully to Him without any restraint. Of course, others have never had any experience with Jesus at all, but you've got the opportunity today. Jesus still seeks and he saves the lost and you can be found by him and experience his marvelous salvation. And maybe while I've been preaching here this morning, you've felt that call of Christ. You've known the pull of the Holy Spirit saying, this is you, you need to respond. Well, trust Jesus for who he is. He is almighty God the Son. Trust Jesus for what he's done when he's gone to the cross for your sins, to die for your sins there, and his resurrection from the grave. Trust Jesus for what he graciously offers, real forgiveness and new and eternal life. Surrender your life to Jesus in repentance and faith, and you will, according to his word, receive his salvation. And you can do that right now as we pray. Father, I thank you so much for sending Jesus for us. Thank you that he has come to seek and to save sinners like us. We did not deserve it. There's nothing we could do to earn it. It is your free gift. And so, Lord, I would pray for anyone in this room, anyone within the sound of my voice, that is not at this moment trusting Jesus alone. For salvation. Help them understand right now your call upon them. Make it evident in their heart that you're telling them to respond. You have come and you are seeking them. Then Lord, I pray that they would have the faith to respond to you right now and they would entrust themselves to you. They would confess that they are sinful people. They would admit their need for Jesus Christ. They would admit their need
to be forgiven, and then they would believe that Jesus does forgive them, that he died on the cross for them, that he rose from the grave, and they would truly commit themselves to Jesus forever. Change them, Lord. Give them new hearts. Make them new creations. Fill them with your spirit that their lives would completely change. And for all of us from this point forward, let us rejoice in the salvation of God. We pray these things in Jesus' name.